we are done with volume today. I think we're going to finish this section, but if we don't, I'm still just calling it. Um, the textbook, if you can credit this, then has another entire <coughs> section also dedicated to volume using a different method. We are going to be skipping that section. Let's just touch on the remaining highlights of section 6.1. So, area, we didn't, you know, we didn't spend a huge amount of time on this, but we did when we were looking at area. We looked at the area between two curves like that, but we also looked at the area between two curves like this. So we can imagine something kind of similar for these volume problems. We can imagine that we have a vertical axis and some curve, and the curve is attached to the axis via these hinges and rotated and it creates the sort of the inner, this region here, traces out a solid shape. And we can ask about the volume of that shape. Well, it's, I mean, the formula is basically ideal identical when you see it written down. Um, so let me get rid of that scribbling. We still have <coughs> the distance between the axis and the curve, and that's still called the radius. We still have A and B telling us what region we're looking at. And the integral is still, the volume, I guess I should say, is still pi times the integral from A to B of the radius squared. Our variable is going to be Y here, just like, <coughs> just like here. The, if this was F and this was G, the area was f minus g dy, likewise here. So let's do an example of this. Uh, well, does everybody have that copied? Let's do an example of this. Let's let f of x be the square root of x between 1 and 2. So this curve something like this. Here's x equals 1, here's x equals 2. But let's rotate, rotate, let's rotate around 
around x equals negative 1. So x equals negative 1 is here. Here's the line we're rotating around. The line is vertical. So now we've got this region. And we're taking this region and we are rotating it around that vertical line. And the formula hasn't changed. The formula is pi times the radius squared. But implementing this formula has changed. So let me get rid of those scribbles. The radius is still with a distance between the line and the curve. That hasn't changed. What has changed is the details of finding the radius. Um, yesterday, when we were talking about finding radii, we took the upper curve minus the lower, we'll think, call it the lower curve, even though it's just a line. And I mean, this was also true if maybe the line was here and the curve was there. The radius was still the upper line minus the lower curve. So we no longer have an upper and a lower, right? That what we have, we have this on the right and this line on the left. And again, very similar, I mean, when we were finding areas, we started with upper minus lower. And then when we looked at this case, it turned into right minus left. Same thing here. We have we have this radius, and this radius is going to be whatever's on the right minus whatever's <coughs> on the left. So naively, I mean, this is the line x equals 1. So naively, we might write, um, OK, the radius, but yeah, I did. I, did I remember the square I asked myself? Yes, I did. The radius, we might naively think, okay, the square root of x minus negative 1 is the square root of x plus 1 squared. We've got the pi, we've got the 1, we've got the 2. But this, basically, none of this can be right. I mean... <laughs> This dy is significant. 
this dy is telling us what our variable is. And everything else has to be in relation to d to y. So these limits of integration have to be values of y, and they're not. This is x equals 1, x equals 2. So the limits of integration I have written are wrong. Likewise, what we have here are functions. We need our variable to be y, not x. So what we have written there is wrong. And we need to rethink this a little. Um, and let me also give myself more room to work with. So thinking through this, here's x equals 1. Here's y equals something. Here's x equals 2, here's y equals something. And those limits, those values of y, I should say, are giving us the limits of integration. y starts here, and y ends here. So what are these values? Well, when x equals 1, y equals what? We have the answer to that question. We're obscuring it a little by using function notation. Our equation, our curve, is y equals the square root of x. So when x equals 1, y equals the square root of 1, which is 1. Fair enough. When x equals 2, y equals the square root of 2, which is 1.4 or something, I think. Some ugly decimal. Let me, uh, let me cage this off so that our stuff isn't melting together. <laughs> and now the radius. It's the right minus the left. Let me get rid of extraneous stuff in this picture. It's the right minus the left, but everything has to be in terms of y. So it can't be the square root of x minus negative 1, because we need our variable to be y, not x. Well, again, if you, if you look at this equation, it comes to our rescue, saying that y equals the square root of x is the same as saying that x equals y squared which, since we needed our variable to be y instead of x, is precisely what we need. Instead of y being the square root of x, x is y squared. And now y squared Minus a negative 1 is positive 1, and this is, this can be dealt with using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Let me 
maybe not totally finish up, because I mean it, we are finishing volume today, no matter what. But let me at least write the integral cleanly. It's the integral, it's pi times the integral from 1 to the square root of 2, y squared plus 1. <coughs> I think, yeah, I have been sloppy here. You can always yell at me if you see a mistake. Remember that it's the radius squared. D Y. And now we've solved about four problems exactly like this already, so maybe um, I won't continue. Foil that out. Once it's foiled out, it's a polynomial. You should be able to take the antiderivative, plug in this, plug in that, subtract that. Okay, one last thing we want to talk about, and then we can finally put this section behind us. And the thing we want to talk about is, suppose instead of a curve, we're given a region in the plane. And then we're given a line, let's just say a horizontal line for simplicity. We're given a horizontal line. And we want to repeat this process we've been doing, more or less. We want to take this region, we want to fasten it to the horizontal line via hinges. And now we take this region and we rotate it around the um, line, around the axis, and it traces something out. It traces out some kind of figure. And I mean, in particular, the figure it's going to trace out is going to be some kind of distorted inner tube type shape. And we can ask about the volume of this sort of distorted inner tube. Um, so this is similar to what we've been doing. I mean, what we've been doing has been taking regions and rotating them around the axes. But these regions that we've been rotating around the axes, in all of the examples we've done so far, have also been touching the axis. I mean, this axis that we're rotating around is one of the sides of the region. Here, that's no longer the case. The region and the axis are not touching. And we're going to do this in a pretty specialized case. So I don't want to well, we're too long on this, but the case we're going to be looking at is the case where this region has a clear, let me erase that fill in, this region has some function, call it f, clearly giving it a lower bound, and then another function, 
call it G, clearly giving it an upper bound. So we've got two functions. They're enclosing a region. We want to take that region. We want to rotate it around the axis. I'll give the formula. I'll talk about the formula a little. The formula is going to look similar to the formulas we've been looking at, but there's going to be a pretty significant difference. So let's start where the formulas are similar. We're going to have an integral from A to B. We're going to have a pi. We're going to have a dx. And we're going to have a radius. But here's where things are going to change. Instead of having one radius, we're going to have two radii. So you remember how we talked about, I guess maybe I, I feared that drawing at some point, but you remember when we were talking about radii, the radius was just the distance between the curve and the axis. Well, here we have an axis, but we have two different curves. So we have two different radii. We have a smaller radius, and we have a larger radius. If we call our larger radius capital R, and we call our smaller radius lowercase r, then we're going to have as our formula the bigger radius squared minus the smaller radius squared. And after that, it will be plug and play, or maybe not quite, but it will just be messing around with the integral. I mean, the integral could be easy, the integral could be impossible, the integral could be somewhere between those extremes. But as far as setting the problem up, this is how we do. And I suppose we'd better do an example. Does anybody have any questions about the formula? So if you're wondering, but where does this formula come from, Dr. Moses? What this formula is doing is, okay, we want We want to find the volume of this inner tube. So what this formula is doing, this part of the formula, the capital R of x squared, is giving us the volume of this entire region. This part of the form of the, this lowercase r of x squared, is giving us the volume of that whole. So we're taking 
the volume of the entire big region, this entire volume, that's the capital R of X, we're removing the whole, we're subtracting the lowercase r of x, and what remains is the volume that we're looking for. One of these notebooks must contain an example. Here we go. Okay, so let's take the region between y equals x minus 2 squared plus 1 and y equals negative x minus 2 squared plus 3. And we're rotating it around um, y equals negative 1. And what we're going to find, this is not the first and it won't be the last time in calculus, um, the algebra and the simplification are going to be the real problem here. When we find the get to the integral, the problem will practically be over. So let's take a look at this. We probably have absolutely no intuition about this region. We're going to get that intuition graphically. Let's take a look at these regions. X minus 2 squared plus 1 and negative x minus 2 squared plus 3. So these curves do trap a region between them. Let me shade that region for you. And we're taking this shaded region and we are rotating it around y was negative one. And our goal then is to find the volume of the resulting uh, the resulting kind of donate donut desk or tireesque shape. So as far as setting this up we need a few things. We need limits of integration at some point. Let's uh, not worry about those for now. We need, we need an upper and a lower radius. So the lower radius is always going to be the smaller one. You start at this axis and you just draw your line up until you hit one of the curves and that's going to be your lower radius. And which of these curves did we hit? We can check on Desmos, but this 
curve we hit is x minus 2 squared plus 1. That's not the radius, though. Remember that the radius is the upper minus the lower. So this curve is the upper negative 1 is the lower. So let me copy this down uh, somewhere. The smaller radius is x minus 2 squared, and our constants combine. Minus negative 1 is plus 2. I'm about to erase the stuff from the lower radius, so does anybody have questions before I do? <coughs> so now we just, we draw our line from the axis and we keep going. This gave us the lower radius. We keep going until we hit the second curve. And that's going to give us the upper radius. And just like with the lower radius, the upper radius is this curve minus this line. The curve is negative x minus 2 squared plus 3. The line is negative 1. So the upper radius is negative x minus 2 squared plus And our integral, and I warned you that the algebra here was going to be kind of exhausting. Our volume is pi. We haven't found our limits of integration yet. But the upper radius... squared minus the lower radius. Squared. And as I say, the calculus is not, I mean, I don't ever say calculus is easy, but the calculus is hopefully routine by now, except to take these antiderivatives, we're going to have to square everything out. Um, before we start that, Thankless task. We are, of course, still missing something. So if we go to Desmos, I mean, the left hand point of this region and the right hand point of this region are points where the curves intersect. So just like when you were finding areas of enclosed regions, you need these points of intersection. And just like when we were finding areas of enclosed regions, I mean, algebraically, we're taking this quadratic and setting it equal to that quadratic. 
but that doesn't sound like a very uh, fun thing to do. We will use Desmos to find these points of intersection for us. You can always tell when a problem has been lab-grown for uh, classroom use when the points of intersection turn out nicely. In this case, one and three. Okay. So, if we want to finish this problem, there's no getting around this. What we're going to do, what we'd better do, is first foil out these smaller squares. If we don't do that, we're going to have things raised to the fourth power, and we do not want to be expanding stuff raised to the fourth power. So, maybe what I'll do is I'll come over here, and did I grab the wrong book? I did. Let's find each of these in turn. This is the lower radius square. So as I say, the reason we, I mean, I said it, but maybe it wasn't really clear just hearing it said out loud. If we start with this upper square, we're going to wind up with an x minus 2 to the 4th power. This x minus 2 squared times itself. And we really don't want to be expanding 4th powers. So let's start inside the bracket. This is x squared minus 4x plus 2. I foiled that. Plus another 2. So. Shouldn't it be 4? Because the negative 2 squared. Negative 2. Yes, thank you. Good catch. Negative 2 squared is 4, plus another 2, we'll make that 6. And then we're squaring this. And yell out if you see me make a mistake. So. We, we're not full, I mean, foil is kind of first outer, inner, last, but it's the same principle. We're going to take all of these terms and we're going to multiply them by each of the three other terms. So we're going to wind up with nine terms in all. Some of them will combine, but x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. x squared times negative 4x is negative 4x cubed. x squared times 6 is 6x squared. Negative 4x times negative 4x is positive 16x squared. Making mistakes already, or at least skipping terms. Let me, let me go to the trouble 
of drawing in these lines. Negative 4x times x squared is negative 4x cubed. Negative 4x times negative 4x, this is the positive 16x squared. Negative 4x times positive 6 is negative 24x. Our last triplet, 6x squared minus 24x <coughs> plus 36. Does anything seem incorrect about any of this? It's the my least favorite part of math, but especially of calculus, is to make some little mistake halfway through one of these steps, and then your integral is wrong, and you have no idea what happened or how to fix it. So if we combine terms, x to the fourth is, I think, our only term of that power. What about x cubed? Minus 4, and then minus another 4, so minus 8x cubed. What about x squared? We've got 6, and 6 is 12, and then another 16, so 18. I make that 28x squared. What about x's? We've got a minus 24 and another minus 24. So we've got a minus 48x. And then we've got a plus 36. Okay, so we're not going to have, I guess, in theory, we have until 9.15, and we could beat our way through this problem if we wanted to. Um, this is the lower um, the lower radius squared. This is lowercase r of x squared. What remains? We've got to take upper case r. We've got to take the upper radius. We've got to square it. And I mean, I normally prefer to just end at 850. All sorts of, I mean, I can never pay attention to lectures for 75 minutes. Maybe you're different, but um, we're going to take this, we're going to square it. It's going to look just like this with the details changed. Then we subtract. We'll get a big old fourth degree polynomial. Take the antiderivative. When we take the antiderivative, it will be a fifth degree polynomial. We're going to plug in one, we're going to plug in three. Both those steps will be kind of exhausting, but it's just stuff you're doing on your calculator. And finally, you finish up in the standard way. 
so I see people shaking their heads. I don't necessarily disagree. This is probably one of my best favorite sections of the textbook, but just do a problem or two like this in the quiz, and then next week we can move on to more interesting and more rounded applications of integral calculus. Uh, let me, I need to mess around with the quiz a little. There was an arc length problem on it. We did not cover arc length this week. So I'm going to just hide it from everyone, mess around with it a bit. It should be visible again by the end of the day.